This audio interview with filmmaker Brett Gregory originally appeared in print form on the Academic Arts and Culture website, Culture Matters, in December 2022. Writer-director Brett Gregory from Manchester in the UK was recently interviewed about Nobody Loves You and You Don't Deserve to Exist, a self-funded film that has won a host of international awards, starring Dave Howell from Brassic, Reuben Clark from Peaky Blinders and Wendy Patterson from Spencer. It's a thought-provoking and powerful working-class feature film exploring solitude, sanity and suffering under the British state. It's loosely based on Hieronymus Bosch's The Garden of Earthly Delights, John Bunyan's A Pilgrim's Progress and Albert Camus' The Myth of Sisyphus. Brett, you wrote and directed this film, which is available now on Amazon Prime. What's it about? Amongst other things, the film is about class and morality, about how those in power treat us and about how we treat each other. It's also about abandonment, loneliness, mental health, and a breakdown in communication between the working and middle classes. In turn, always in the background, is this country's north-south divide. How this is continually reinforced by the right wing in order to distract and weaken any serious collective opposition to the systematic asset stripping of what remains of the United Kingdom. In terms of plot, it starts with old Jack in his gloomy flat in Hume in 2020 under Boris Johnson's reign. He reads an old text from the wife of a good friend who informs him that her husband is on a ventilator with COVID and that she is struggling to breathe herself. He also discovers that he has an unwelcome voicemail on his phone from his long lost grandmother in Oxford who wishes to secretly meet up with him after four decades before she dies. All of this proves too much for him, however, and he takes a fistful of antidepressants and washes them down with a mug of vodka. Thus begins his descent into his own private rabbit hole, where he meets himself as a young boy in 1984, living on a rundown council estate under Margaret Thatcher during the miners' strike, and fantasising about escaping into a world of fiction and illusion. He is then later confronted by himself as a university student in 1992, during John Major's tenure, riddled with class A drugs, alienated from his peers and his studies, and questioning his purpose and sanity in violent messianic outbursts. These psychotic visitations are intercut with imagined Brechtian interviews with a number of women from old Jack's past, who seem to appear not only as witnesses, but also as judge and jury. His half-sister, his old English teacher, his former college manager, his ex-girlfriend's Christian mother, his nervous next door neighbour. Overcome by the weight of his own history, in a country where he doesn't believe he belongs anymore, old Jack finally embarks on a pilgrimage to the historical Stooley Pike Monument in West Yorkshire, on the outskirts of society, to find some sort of answer which will put an end to his misery. What were you aiming for with the film? And what has been the reaction from critics and working class audiences? A crucial aim of the film was to represent the Northern working class on screen with intelligence, authenticity and dignity, in direct opposition to the demeaning stereotypes and caricatures which are regularly churned out by the corporate mainstream media based in London. Such a genuinely independent, countercultural creative decision directly challenges the status quo currently being maintained by the ideological state apparatus in the cultural industries. And so, of course, we receive no funding or investment or support from any public or private organisation. As a result, what changed was not only the timescale of the production from one year to six and a half years, but also my personal finances. Even though every one of the cast and crew members committed their time and talents for free, a testament to the ongoing industriousness and inventiveness of Greater Manchester, by the way, the production still left me around £36,000 in debt by way of personal loans, two credit cards and two overdrafts. Since its release on Amazon Prime in May 2022, we have won over 50 International Film Festival awards and nominations, and received over 100 informed and passionate reviews on IMDb, Letterboxd and various culture websites. In the main, these reviews praise the film's anger, insight and originality, its production values, its performances and its soundtrack. 
comparing it to the works of Ken Loach, Mike Lee, Alan Clark, and even Theodore Dreyer. Standout quotes such as a searing portrait of modern Britain are incredibly validating and prove that a large international audience who are also going through their own individual horrors under globalised capitalism need authentic stories like this to remind them that they're not alone and they're not going mad. We hosted a free screening of the film on a working class Manchester housing estate in Moston and many of the attendees recognised the role poverty, alcoholism, drug use and domestic abuse have played in their day-to-day -day lives. A few also said that cinema should be entertaining and escapist, however, and commented on the complex plot and time shifts in the film. How do you respond to people who say that independent art house films are too difficult for a general audience to understand? Years ago, I used to teach A-level cultural studies. And whenever a new cohort of 16 year olds would arrive in the classroom in September, I'd introduce the subject to them as a brand new way of looking at the world and everything in it. Naturally, the students who could be bothered to glance up from their phones would just pull a face at me. So I'd start telling them a story about Picasso, the weird famous painter who they'd hopefully heard about at school. And on the smart board, I'd pull up a copy of his 1937 portrait called The Weeping Woman. This story may or may not be true, but it sounds true. And that's the point. So, it's 1937 and Picasso is at this big party celebrating the completion of his latest masterpiece, The Weeping Woman, a study in female suffering. While he's standing there next to his painting, sipping a glass of champagne, a wealthy businessman then steps over to speak with him. Picasso, he says, your new painting doesn't make any sense to me at all. It's called The Weeping Woman, but it doesn't look like anything like a woman. What do you mean exactly? Picasso asks. Well, she's all broken up into triangles for starters, and both of her eyes are on the same side of her face, he exclaims. It's ridiculous. She looks like a child's unfinished jigsaw puzzle. But senor, replies Picasso, this is a portrait of my lover who I care about very deeply. And whenever she's crying and there's nothing I can do about it, this is how she appears to me, broken and in pieces. On a good day, after I finished telling this story, most of the students who'd been looking down at their phones would now be looking up at Picasso's painting with a smile on their faces, their eyes illuminated. A female student, usually, would suddenly announce, Ooh, I really like that story. What do you think of the history of British cinema and the role it has played in our society? The history of British cinema can primarily be understood in how it portrays class and class divisions which flow from the hierarchical nature of this country's social system, which, in turn, creates advantages and disadvantages for different social groups in different parts of the country. Many of us alive today first learned of the existence and influence of the rules and rewards of social class as children, while watching, for instance, David Lean's Great Expectations from 1946, Carol Reed's Oliver from 1968, or Richard Fleischer's The Prince and the Pauper from 1977. Repeated screenings of these movies usually took place in a school assembly or in the family living room over the Christmas period. And I would argue such public exhibitions contributed to a cultural normalization of social prejudice, inequality and exclusion by disguising these conditions as simply an inevitable part of British history and tradition. While the 1960s new wave angry young man arrived and blew a plume of cigarette smoke in the face of authority, articulating alternative expectations and aspirations for white working class British males, such insubordination was given short shrift. Despite dynamic and memorable performances from Richard Burton in Look Back in Anger in 1959, Albert Finney in Saturday Night and Sunday Morning in 1960, and Richard Harris in This Sporting Life in 1963, it is telling that their character arcs always concluded with them being either abandoned or emasculated as punishment for not knowing their place. Against the cartoonish backdrop of the Carry On franchise and its production line of pathetic proletariats, 
The trajectory of Michael Caine's filmography throughout the 1970s provides an interesting counterpoint in that his commercial success rested largely upon the reappropriation of his Cockney origins, persona and on-screen roles. For example, only five or so years after the incendiary anti-establishment release of Get Carter in 1971, he was suddenly battling on behalf of Queen and Country in The Eagle Has Landed in 1975 and A Bridge Too Far in 1976. It is no surprise then that when he left to further pursue the capitalist dream of Hollywood fame and fortune later in the decade, he was more or less deified by the country's mainstream media. Of course, everything exploded when Margaret Thatcher came to power in 1979 and cultural war was openly declared on the men and women of the labour movement and their representation across Britain's sterling silver screens. In the blue corner were David Putnam, Richard Attenborough and Merchant Ivory, and in the red corner were Mike Lee, Dennis Potter and Alan Clark. Noticeably, state school kids were far too busy reciting profanities in the playground from Scum in 1979 or Made in Britain in 1982 to give a toss about the posh swag bag of Academy Awards accrued by state-supported nostalgia narratives such as Chariots of Fire in 1981 or Gandhi in 1982. I should note here that Michael Caine did go some way to redeem himself in this decade, however, by supporting Julie Walters' wonderful working class lead in Willie Russell's intellectually aspirational Educating Rita in 1993. Under the tenures of John Major and Tony Blair in the 1990s, the changing of the guard necessarily took place and Richard Curtis and Kenneth Branagh dutifully took up their well-financed positions with Four Weddings and a Funeral in 1994 and Notting Hill in 1999, Much Ado About Nothing in 1993 and Hamlet in 1996. Meanwhile, as a reflection of the ongoing embourgeonment of mainstream British culture and society, authentic working class cinema not only had to search for its roots and values in the iconography of the underclass or poverty porn, it had to also search for its funding abroad. Films such as Mike Lee's Naked in 1993, Danny Boyle's Trainspotting in 1996, Gary Oldman's Nil by Mouth in 1997, and Ken Loach's My Name is Joe in 1998, highlighted that the remnants of working class togetherness and community could now only subsist on the margins by way of the narrative ritualisation of petty crime, drugs or alcohol. During the 21st century, as the British Empire suffers its death throes and the country's post-Elizabethan standing on the world stage rapidly dwindles away, the establishment, in an attempt to remain in power, has reacted by reasserting outmoded notions of cinematic representation that are increasingly reductive, intolerant and undemocratic. While commercially successful film franchises like James Bond, Harry Potter, Downton Abbey and The Crown continue to suffocate the growing diversity and demands of our shared culture, the mediated elevation of privately educated white male screen actors such as Benedict Cumberbatch, Eddie Redmayne and Tom Hiddleston has seemingly transported us back to the post-world performances of Laurence Olivier, Alec Guinness and David Niven. It is no coincidence that the working class white male protagonist in my film has no community around him. He sleeps alone, he drinks alone and he weeps alone. He lives in a society that disrespects, mocks and ignores working people's invaluable economic, cultural and historical contributions to this nation. Like many others, he feels that nobody loves him and that he doesn't deserve to exist. How could trade unions and their activists get involved in helping to promote Nobody Loves You and You Don't Deserve to Exist to a wider audience? A first step would be for trade unions to show active support by directly recommending it to their members, their friends and their families. The film explicitly explores in detail issues that are close to working class experience. The human consequences of redundancy, unemployment and the debilitating process of claiming universal credit. 
If there are activists who have access to screening facilities, I'm also more than happy to send them a free copy of the film for exhibition. Email me at brett at seriousfeather.com. Such a public display of support from the trade unions would hopefully inspire filmmakers to work with them to create challenging and humane narratives from a non-corporate perspective. So the effects of, say, austerity cuts, COVID corruption and the cost of living crisis can be rigorously and memorably explored as we continue to suffer under this nice and shiny neoliberal kleptocracy of ours. Just look at the ruckus RMT leader Mick Lynch has been causing on a weekly basis on inane television programmes like ITV's This Morning or BBC Breakfast and the real hope this has inspired in ordinary people sitting at home. Just think about what else we could achieve together, how much further we could go in order to bring back honour, dignity, fairness and intelligence back to the British Isles.